morning, church. Come on in. Come on in if you're not in. <laughs> Give everybody a second here to get settled in. It's really good to see you all this morning, as always. Blessing to be here, as always. We've got um, some new faces that, that we know that, that are back, which is really great. And uh, it's just good to be, I used to say it's good to be in church. It's good to be with church. <laughs> you know, it's good to be with you all. I, uh, I'm blessed every time I come. Every time. Um, all right. We're going to just, we've got, we have a ton of announcements <laughs> to make, which is not a bad thing. They're all really good things. But I'm going to get this rolling so that we can, we can get, get through our announcements this morning. So good, good day yesterday. We're going to hear some more about that from Miss Barbara Nemo. Come on up and let us know something. and 76 boxes. Right. And I wanted to say a special thank you to Judy Herndon. She was so good about planning things, sorting things, counting things, buying things. She did great. And we worked for about two hours every week for a long, long time. And um, she, she just organized everything so good. And I also wanted to say thank you to Carolyn Silman. We don't see Carolyn Silman very much on Sundays anymore since the coronavirus, but she was here on those work days, so she is still faithful working for our church. And I also wanted to say thank you to Maxine. She was here on those work days too, and she made a million trips up and down those steps. And. Um, I also wanted to thank all of those who donated supplies for these boxes. Everybody was just so generous. If you could just have seen the uh, fellowship hall, it looked like a little dollar store back there. <laughs> and uh, I also want to thank the donation for the fees. The fee is $9 for each box, and we have somebody who donates the money to pay for all the fees. So that's a big donation. Yeah. And, uh, and I also wanted to thank all of those who helped yesterday. We had about 25 people, and it was hard work. Everybody worked hard, and everybody was exhausted afterwards, right? <laughs> and um, I just want to say thank you, God, for bringing it all together. Amen. And I want to ask God to bless each and every one of these boxes that they will end up in the right hands and bless the children who receive them and maybe whoever does the morning prayer if they can. We're going to do that right now. Let's yeah. Stay right there, boy. Stay right there. Right here. You, come on. Come on. You don't have to pray. I was just going to pray with you. <laughs> We're going to pray right now over these boxes. Let's do that. Let's do that. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much, so much for the blessing of servants' hearts in this church, Father. Uh, God, we believe with all our heart that the reason we have them is because you placed that in us. God, we're so grateful, so grateful, God, to know that you've come and you live inside of us, Lord. Such a blessing to know, Lord, that you love us the way you do and you can use us the way you do. Father, I pray that you just bless this church, bless the heart of the church that just wants these boxes to go out, God, for the sake of sharing the gospel. Lord, I pray, and I know that you do this, Lord. We've heard the testimonies, and we just trust you at your word, Lord, that these boxes will go out, and they will be impactful. God, that they will change lives for the sake of Jesus. Lord, I pray, I pray that you use this church, uh, not just our church, God, but specifically I pray for this church. Uh, Lord, that you use the hearts that, that came to serve, God, and that souls will be saved through the effort. Uh, God, we give you all the glory in it. We're grateful to be a part of it, Lord. And I just pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brad, I forgot to ask one thing. Those who took pictures, if you could send them to me by email, I would like to include your pictures in the video. 
So, yep. If you've got pictures of, of yesterday and you can share them with John Underwood, his email, he will, uh, he will include it in what he's putting together. ASAP. All right. Yeah, Judy, of course. When I looked at the table before we passed, I said, look what God has done. Mm. These boxes are going to reach children. That's awesome. And then they will tell others about Jesus. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's how it works. Praise God. Thank you. <laughs> wonderful. Really wonderful. Um, I'm going to call Matt Johnson. Come on up here. All right. Good morning, church. I want to make an announcement, continuation on uh, Samaritan's Purse. Uh, this is a blessing to see all these boxes up here. And now, of course, we got to get all these boxes to a drop-off point. And um, the drop-off point this year is going to be at uh, Spring Hill Baptist Church. And um, what I'm going to try to do is get a trailer out here, uh, hopefully, maybe next Sunday. And um, we'll load all the boxes after the church service uh, into the trailer. And then at that point, um, we got some guys that are going to help with us to, uh, to get the trailer to Spring Hill. There's only certain times and stuff that can be uh, delivered there. And, um, they're cutting the time off at 12 o'clock, which we won't be able to make right after church service, but there are other days that are available. And also, I want to make an announcement for um, Hope for Appalachia. Uh, time's getting close. We are uh, going uh, here uh, probably November 29th, I think, is our travel day. We're going to be leaving. Uh, me, Bill Klimek, and Kyle is here today. Good to see him. And uh, we're going to be traveling to Kentucky. And I have a couple dates. Uh, we're going to be packing uh, November 20th is at uh, the Gathering Church. And um, they're counting on me to bring a gang up there to uh, get a lot of work done. So I'm counting on you, church, to, uh, to, to help me uh, get that resolved. Um, I'm hoping one of the guys can maybe uh, drive the church bus or something. And uh, we'll try to get together as a time we're leaving all that stuff. It's from 9 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You can come whenever you want to. Um, there's going to be some food provided and stuff like that. And um, there's a lot of work to get done. Then also November 27th is uh, packing the trailer at New Salem Baptist Church. And, um, and as the church has been involved with packing the trailer, you guys know it's a lot of work to get that done also. And um, that is at 9 o'clock in the morning also until the trailer is packed. We'll let you go after that. Uh, but if you have any questions, just contact me. And um, I appreciate for all that you guys do. And uh, it's a blessing to see this church at work. And uh, I'm just glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have transportation available. If you want to go as a group, we'll, we'll, we'll make an announcement uh, through a one call of how that'll work. But we'll, we'll definitely ride the church van and we'll, we'll get that tightened up. Um, Kendra Morris has an announcement, I think, through or for the Sunday school.
filtration systems creating nets to save drinking water and afford these opportunities to share the gospel and that is how you got out. Another thing we buy is to help a family raise cattle. Everything in the earth belongs to the Lord, even the cattle on a thousand hills. Psalms 50, 10, Psalms 50, 10, Samaritan's Purse is demonstrating God's goodness to poor families by providing them with livestock as well as veterinary services and vocational training. By teaching them to raise these animals, we are helping them become self-raised, uh, self-income they earn by sharing sheep or milking cows and helping pay school fees and medical bills and other expenses. And that was What a blessing. Blessing to hear those kids quote the scripture. <laughs> Tell you what. Bless my heart. All right, I've got a, a letter I'm, I'm going to read here to your church. All right, this is from Feeding Green. Rhonda Oliver wrote our church a, a message here, and I uh, just want to share it with you. So it says, Dear Brothers and Sisters in Christ, I want to thank you for your recent donation of $575 to Feeding Green. We simply could not do what we do without the support of faithful donors like you. We are nearing completion of renovations, which include a walk-in cooler, a walk-in freezer, a stock room to store more food and receiving area. We plan to have our storefront set up by October 19th to let families back into the pantry to shop. Families will be allowed to come once a week and do their own shopping, much like in a normal grocery store. Volunteers will be stationed to assist as families become familiar with the new setup. Our plan is to increase our fresh produce options, provide nutritional education, and offer other resources such as health screenings and food safety to promote health and wellness among the families in our community. None of this would be possible without the continued support of donors like you. We pray that God will bless you as you have so generously blessed us. Prayers for health, healing, and hope uh, in 2021. Um, it just says, so grateful to have your support. Many, many blessings. Thank you, church. All right, are there any other special announcements that I may have missed <laughs> this morning? All right, there, there are other announcements written in the bulletin, and for sake of time, I'm just going to encourage you to read them. But they're in there uh, sharing some, some thoughts of what's going on here at church. Um, I want to take just a moment. Everything that we talked about, honestly, this morning in our announcements and every week are super important things. I really have a heart, and I know you all do too, that when we come to this place, that we really just take a moment and focus on our Savior. You know, all of the things that we do and, and, and are able to do, really, are all because of him. Everything that we share, <laughs> the good things that happen, he gets all the glory and all the credit. We're here to worship. And I just want to share a scripture God really laid on my heart. It's not, a, it's not an unfamiliar scripture. It's short, but it's something that Jesus said. He said it to his disciples while he was eating with them on the Last Supper. And it's just something that when we understand, I think, how Jesus was saying it, uh, it really, it, it, it has a little deeper meaning than maybe how we read it on the surface. And uh, in John chapter 13, uh, verses 34 and 35, I'm sure this is very familiar scripture for most of you. Jesus says this, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. I just want to take a quick minute because on the surface we have messed up the word love. We just have. Every time Jesus says love in there it's the word agape. Every time. And that scripture for me does a couple of things. When we think about what that word means agape, that's God's love for us. 
That is the undeserving. No merit from us, love. That he has poured out on us through his son. He gives it freely with nothing, looking for nothing. That's the same kind of love Jesus is calling us to have for each other. That's hard love. But that's the way God loves us. And I'm telling you, church, when you look around this building and the people that you see, God just really ripped my heart out. I pray that we love each other that way. Because Jesus says if we do that right, people will know <laughs> who you are. So I just pray God blesses his word. It's hard to do. <laughs> That's why we come here, though. We come here to encourage and lift each other up. And I am so blessed to be a part of this church family. <laughs> I think we do pretty good. But we got to keep seeking him to do better. And people will know. So God bless his word. God bless his word. All right. I think I lost my bulletin. <laughs> Wilbur, let's sing a hymn. How about it? Number 500. Let's stand together and sing Trust and Obey. I want to take this time to remind the church that we have in your bulletins uh, our, our list of prayer concerns that are um, certainly you know something that we keep up with they've been ongoing 
every week we just want to encourage you to, to look at those prayer list concerns and, and, and just take a moment to pray over them during your week. Um, right now in the service, I definitely want to uh, give you the opportunity, if there's something that is not someone who is not on this list or a concern that's not on this list, we definitely want to add that. Uh, and get it on here so so the church can be praying about it. So is there is there anything that is not currently on the list? Yeah. So Janice, real quick, name your name name of your son in law again is John Sean. Sean? That's awesome. That's, we can, we'll, we'll put it on here to pray about. That's great. Anyone else? Okay. Okay. Yep. So Earl and Barnetta Bennett, we can we can take them off, but continue to pray for their mother-in-law, Francis. Gail. That's Joyce Pittman, Gail's sister. Go ahead, Justin. Free. Wonderful. Wonderful. Another praise. Yeah, that's a great praise. That's wonderful, baby. All right. Oh, go ahead. My boss, Mike Dean, is on the prayer list, but he's going to have an operation tomorrow to hopefully remove all the cancer. Barbara's boss, Mike Dean, has an operation tomorrow. Okay. And Bill Thomas? Certainly. Additionally, 
So Wayne's at home, not feeling great. Talk to him this morning, and I have a prayer request from him as well, which honestly was a blessing to, to, to hear this. So Wayne's, not, Wayne's at home, not feeling good, and he's calling me about a heart that he has for, for someone else. And uh, he, call, he called about a man named Ron, uh, Ronnie Devers, uh, 80-year-old gentleman, has got lung cancer, uh, has now just been diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. Um, as far as the timeline goes, that, that doesn't look really good according to, to what Wayne was told for, for his life. Um, certainly we're going to pray for healing as we always do, and Wayne said just, just a really special prayer for, for salvation um, for Ronnie Devers. Uh, his, wife, his wife currently has dementia. Her name is Jeanette. She, she is a believer, and, uh, and honestly, I'll say this. I'm not trying to talk about anybody, but you know, Wayne honestly said he's not sure about Ronnie's salvation. So just, it's just something we should be praying for, you know. And it was noted in several of your prayer requests this morning. I, I don't know if you, if you caught that, but I hope that's always, like, what's really, really on our heart. Yeah. Um, anyone else this morning? We're going we're gonna to pray. All right, let's bow our heads together. Let's, let's really just take this time and just, and just seek God's, uh, God's hand in this and, and the things that are going on. Um, let's pray. Father, we just come to you again, Lord, this morning. Uh, first and foremost, God, just grateful. So grateful, God, for the love that you have for us. Father, the fact that we uh, not only know that we can talk to you, God, but that in your word you encourage us to, Lord. You encourage us to, to seek you, Lord. You encourage us to pray without ceasing. God, you promise us in your word that you hear our prayer. Lord, I pray that you would just use the, the hearts of the people in this church, Lord. Um, the prayers that are going up right now, Lord, as we just uh, have this time. God, that you would just consider the situations that we've spoken of. Uh, God, it truly blows my mind that you, that you care about us the way you do. That you care to hear these things. Big or small, God, whether it's life and death or, or a knee surgery or a book, Lord, that you care. God, I'm just, uh, I'm just grateful to you, Lord, to know that you hear our heart. And Father, because we know you hear us, I just pray that you teach us to trust you. I pray that in everything, God, that we'd ask you to do, that we trust that you have the right answer. God, in every circumstance that's so near and dear to the person that's asking for the request, I just pray, God, that you help our heart recognize that you have the right answer. Lord, I pray that uh, you'd give us a heart to look at people the way you do, Lord, and that, and that your will, which is that people come to know your son Jesus, uh, Lord, is what comes out of the circumstance. I pray you use this church family, God, Use everyone that made a request this morning, Lord, uh, to be a part of that happening. I pray you open our eyes, open our hearts and our minds, God, to see the times and the moments that you put in front of us, God, to do the things that you ask. Uh, Lord, and that all, in all of these things, Father, uh, that you would be the one that's lifted up, glorified. God, that people would come to know Jesus and be saved through what's going on. I pray, God, that you'd use this morning, use the time that we have here left, Lord, in our worship and certainly in hearing of your word. God, to touch a heart if they don't know you. God, I pray that if there's someone here that uh, is unsure, God, that you clear it up. And Lord, I certainly pray for everyone that's a believer here this morning. I pray, God, that you'd encourage the believer's heart to seek you more, Lord, to trust you more. And God, that we get serious about doing your work. Uh, God, I know I need help in that. And God, I just pray that for our whole church family. I pray for your blessings on the rest of the service, Father. We're grateful, grateful to be here, Lord, grateful to be able to serve you with the freedom we have. And God, we pray it in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to sing again. Come on, Wilbur. We're going to do number 511, The Solid Rock. Love this hymn.
Hey, good morning. Isn't it great being in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. And I tell you what, there's a spirit here, the Holy Spirit, and you just just feel that bond of family and and uh, and that spirit of giving and just just so much to be grateful for. And it's it's nice to see some of our uh, fellow family members, uh, church family members that have been away for a while, but they've joined us. And uh, it's uh, where is Kyle? So Kyle, there he is. Good to see you, Kyle and Marcia. <laughs> Fabulous. So anyway, join us in our scripture reading. We'll be starting at Jeremiah 29, starting at verse 11, going through verse 13. And uh, give you just a moment to get there. All right, Jeremiah 29, starting at verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now, if you'll turn with me over to the New Testament, we'll be reading at Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 12. Okay, Colossians 3, verse 12. Going through 15. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If any has if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is in bond which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. May God, God bless the reading of His Word. I hope you'll join me in prayer. And after we pray, we're going to go ahead and take up the offering. And uh, let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be in your house. Father, we thank you for this spirit. We thank you for this spirit of love and uh, family that you have blessed this church with. And Father, we thank you as we read in uh, Jeremiah that, Father, you never leave us. You're always there. If we will but turn to you, Father, and seek you with our hearts, and pray sincerely, Father, you, you do not leave us alone, and you will hear us, and you will redeem us, Father. And Father, what a, what a precious time it is of year that uh, we're coming up on Thanksgiving, and we're able to, to put forth our resources and our time to uh, contribute to different uh, charitable activities, and uh, we're able to give thanks and then, Father, the Christmas season is upon us where we, where we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ, that you, you sent in the, into this world to save us. That was your plan of redemption, Father. And we just ask that uh, this time of the year not be wasted on us, that, uh, that we celebrate you and we celebrate the opportunity that we've been given to be uh, brothers and sisters with Christ and to be your children, Father. And now as we uh, go in to take up our offering, we thank you again, Father, for this opportunity to give back just a small portion of what you've blessed us with. And uh, I, for one, and I think everybody knows and can say the same, that we have blessed, you have blessed us so richly, Father, that uh, we're all guilty of not even acknowledging those blessings. It's just come so commonplace that we, we unfortunately take it for granted. So... Father, we ask you, you ask your help to do better with that. Please forgive us. And Father, we thank you once again for this time of fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Our brother Roy Brown is going to share some music with us here. Um, just so I don't forget when he's done. When, when Roy's done playing, the, uh, the children can go back to Children's Church. I'll try to remind you again when he's done. But uh, just feel free to get up when the song is over. Roy, share with us, brother. Good morning. Good morning, Roy. Good morning, Pastor Kyle, Marsha. Hi, Roy. It's a pleasure. My goodness. I uh, want to say the psalmist said there, uh, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord so that we might worship Him today. And it's really good to be here. And I want to thank Earl, his lovely wife, for being here. I hope Marsha takes notice because the both of them have lovely voices. And I am looking forward again to when they sing. So Marsha, uh, take notice. <laughs> it's good, good to see them both there. there. In fact, it's good to see all of them. Steve and his lovely wife too. Uh, good to be here. I'm going to sing a song here that I, I've sang it here before there. I, uh, I might have a little sorry, a little trouble getting started there because of the new time here. I didn't get an opportunity to warm up here a little bit. Here, but I guess that's okay there. Okay, John, I hear you over there. I know, I know, I know how you are. It's called Can You Imagine That? This is not the same Imagine that that uh, the other guy did, but this is a little bit different. Someday the Lord will be sent. Imagine 
imagine the price that he paid. Still my favorite song too, Pastor. Get into the Word of God here with uh, Brother Doug Dodd. He's going to bring us a message this morning. He uh, he informed me that rather than preach his whole message this morning, he's going to split it into two Sundays. To save you all. He's going to, we're going to let him preach again next Sunday too. Uh, so we took we took a lot of his time, but uh, it's all good. We're going to let him come up here, brother, and preach. Man. Bless your heart. There's a water for you. It's unopened if you need it. Good morning. It's good to be here. As uh, Brandon mentioned, um, if you were here a few weeks ago, uh, I may have gone a little long, perhaps. And uh, Chris told me afterwards, he said, I think you broke the record, Doug. <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> I will not be breaking any records today, so, uh, so today they, they were just like, you know, to be sure, why don't we split it up, okay? Uh, you don't have to do it all today, uh, we'll, we'll give you next week too, so, um, so that's what's going to happen. But um, first of all, thanks to uh, everybody that's participated in the service so far, uh, Roy for the beautiful song, Barbara for the beautiful music beforehand, uh, and uh, for everybody who's uh, taken part in the service so far. Uh, Bill, thank you for your readings, and uh, uh, for everybody that makes this happen. And I don't know if you guys, I hope, I hope, as Brandon shared, that you can feel it out there. But there is a spirit in this place, and I mean, it's just permeating the room. I mean, I hope you're able to, to catch it, because uh, back there in the back, being able to see, you know, everybody in front of me, um, it's just, I don't know, it just feels good. And uh, it is, as Roy said, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. And, uh, praise God. Um, so last time um, I uh, brought out, uh, I hadn't talked for a while, and so I had a bunch of visual aids and props that I pulled out as part of the sermon. Um, there won't be any more of those today. Uh, and uh, Annie was like, no, no, kill the props. You don't need props. <laughs> Save one. Only one prop today. All right, so uh, here's the thing. Um, today's message is going to be about, it's, it's, you know, God just knows what he's doing. Uh, today, as was printed up and as I gave uh, Dawn to put in the bulletin, the, uh, the message is about joy in unity. Last time I spoke, I spoke about joy generally, joy in, you know, the Christian life. And, uh, but this time I was going to get a little bit more specific well, I am going to get a little bit more specific. And, uh, and really, it's joy in unity, but it could just as easily be titled joy in service because the two go hand in hand, as we will share. Um, and so far, all I've heard is about the service, the servants 
uh, that are in this place and all of the, the fantastic work that we're doing as a church. Uh, and that's not to sing our praises other than the fact that that's God at work in us. And, uh, you know, you can see here uh, and, and listen and all the other things that are going on, um, you know, that servant's heart is, uh, is definitely in this place and it is in all the people in this place. And so um, I am very, very happy, as Brandon said, uh, and blessed to be a part of this church and to be a part of this uh, servanthood that uh, this place is characterized by. So um, in terms of that unity, it's funny, I mean, I'm saying that now, I'm reminded of uh, my first Sunday at Rutgersville Baptist Church. Um, some 10, 11 years ago now, uh, I've told this story before, but um, Annie and I had heard about the fire. This church, in case you weren't aware, uh, some of you that are relatively new, um, this church burned and, and was vandalized and burned down, essentially. Um, and, uh, and it made the news, and Annie and I were sort of in between churches at the time, and uh, we sort of said to each other, you know, let's go up there and, and just sort of, you know, lend our support. Let, let's show our support to the folks up there. And... Um, we weren't sure how they were having service, and so Annie actually called Kyle and uh, said, would it be okay if, if we came? And uh, he explained what was going to happen and, uh, and how they were going to do service, and sure enough, uh, we showed up on that Sunday, the Sunday after the fire, and uh, in the burned-out skeleton of this building, the shadow of that uh, burnt skeleton in the pavilion out there were folding chairs. They had rolled a piano out, and they, held, they had church. Rutgersville Baptist Church had, had church in that pavilion. And the, the thing was, so Annie and I, again, thinking to ourselves, hey, we're going to offer our support. We're going to lend our support to these folks. We showed up thinking that. And we no more walked on the grounds, and we were engulfed by, uh, I think, I know Wayne and Kathy, uh, there were a few other folks, uh, we were just engulfed by the spirit. They came to us with bright, shining smiles and like, wow, thank you so much. It's so great to have you here. The service itself was filled with joy, uh, again, in the shadow of a burned out skeleton of a building. And we loved the service. We loved the people. We just felt that love from everybody. And as we left that, uh, after church that day, we said to each other, there's something special about this place. And what we really meant was there's something special about the people in this place. And the thing is, that was a time of transition for the church, mainly transition, you know, as far as the building was concerned. But we're in another time of transition. The church is about to transition again, not in the form of a tragedy necessarily, but in the form of things changing a little bit. And I think just like then, it's really important for us now to cling to one another. Amen. It's really important for us to focus on that unity that we've already felt this morning, but that we have in droves uh, in, in this place and in these people. And uh, I think it is, we, we have to make sure that we focus on the unity now uh, as we enter some, you know, um, there's an unknown. There's some uncertainties ahead. And, uh, and we want to make sure, as long as we were talking about it, Brandon and I, this morning, as long as we are holding on to one another and holding on to the one who makes all the difference, um, it's all going to work out. We are not a church in trouble. We are not a church having problems. Uh, we're a church going through a transition. And as long as we hang on to God and we hang on to each other, uh, we're going to make it through this. And this is actually, Dave Shelton said it fantastically. Uh, we had a business meeting this, pa <clears throat> excuse me, this past week. And he stood up at the end of that meeting and he said, guys, this is actually an opportunity for us right now. We are in a time of uh, what should be joy and anticipation. What does God have in in plans for us next. What's going to happen? Because there's a plan. Uh, and as we read in uh, some of the scriptures, which we'll get to in just a moment, 
Um, that plan is for a future and for hope. And it's all going to, when all is said and done, we're going to look back uh, just like we do now at this building. Uh, we look back and we're like, wow, why did this place have to burn down? And I've said it before, and it was met with some unusual looks at the time when I said it, and I get it, uh, especially if you were here. But I've said in the past, I'm glad the church burned. That sounds weird, especially to those of you who uh, went through that time. It was not a time of joy and gladness uh, to go through that. But I'm glad it did because that's how God brought me here. That's how God made the changes. That's how God got this building here. Not, it's just a building, but still, God made blessings out of what had originally been planned for harm. And right now, I don't know what those blessings are, but I know God's got some blessings planned for us. And when we go on, get on the other side of this uh, and the transition time is over, we're going to look back and we're going to think, wow, look at what God did. And uh, anyway... That, in a nutshell, is what today's sermon is all about. And I could stop right now, and you're like, yeah, please do, Doug. No, no. There's a little bit more. Sorry. Um, so we're going to go back. And uh, all of this is me telling you, you know, from my perspective. But uh, we want to look and see what God has to say in his word about that. Um, you've already heard a little bit of that. And I'll just uh, go back and very quickly um, highlight but what, um, what Bill mentioned in those two scriptures this morning directly related to this, okay? First of all, Jeremiah, the first one, that idea, if you want to go back there, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. And this is a, a passage of scripture that um, I have used many times with individuals, you know, with kids that are graduating school, uh, with, with others who are about to embark on a new adventure or something. Um, I've said these things and quoted them to them and saying, you know, God has plans for you. God has a hope, plans for a hope and a future. Uh, it's all going to work out. But this wasn't originally written to an individual. It was originally written to God's chosen people who happened to be in exile at the time. But it was written to a group. Okay? And I think it, it bodes well and it, and it applies itself well now to us as a group. Uh, Hope and a future is what we're looking forward to. In Colossians, Paul, also inspired by God, of course, um, is talking more specifically. Okay? He's talking more specifically about this unity thing. Sorry. Forgive me. Um, and he gets real specific. And he says, okay, uh, God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. In other words, put these things on. Compassion. Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with each other. And here's a big one. Forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone. I mean, there's, this place is full of love, and it's full of spirit, and it's full of good people. And yet, even in, in the midst of that, think of a family. Uh, you know, uh, it was already said in several times, we're members of the Ruckersville Baptist Church family. And... In the best of families, there's often conflict. There's often people who say things that they shouldn't have said or done things that they shouldn't have done. And the key to remaining unified in that family is forgiveness. So let's forgive each other of any of the things that happen to be burdening our hearts right now. If we're like, wow, why did that person do that? Why did that person say that? Um, you know, ideally, you would go to that person and explain, you know, how you feel. But if that's beyond what you can do uh, or feel comfortable doing, at the very least, forgive them. Even if you don't have to go to them and say, hi, I forgive you. Forgive them in your heart. Okay? Forgiveness is more about the forgiver than it is about the person being forgiven. So have some forgiveness. Over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Okay? Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Again, I could stop right here and you're saying, yeah, go ahead, Doug. No, no, no. More to come. All right. The bulk of today's message 
uh, is going to come from the book of Philippians. And I think I mentioned this last time when I talked about uh, joy in general. Philippians, uh, probably my favorite book uh, in the Bible, and it is all about joy. Joy is all over that book um, in different ways. But today we're going to focus on chapter 2. And in your bulletin it says 1 through 11. Uh, we're going to split that up. So we're going to do like the first half of that uh, today and, uh, and, and focus on um, the initial part of this, which I think probably is more appropriate for what's been going on so far today in church. So, um, the Philippians. Excuse me, a little bit of background, uh, just a little. Um, Paul didn't originally intend to go to Philippi. Philippi was the city. Uh, and Philippi happens to be in Macedonia, which is essentially Greece, which is essentially Europe now, if you look there. It was the first time that he had ventured into Europe out of what we would now describe as Asia. Back then, they had a different name for Asia. It was basically Turkey was where he spent all of his time. But anyway, he got a vision. He had a vision. God said in this vision, hey, as a man, man said, please come to Macedonia. And so he did. And he went there. He's always uh, faithful to those visions uh, when God told him to go somewhere and when God told him not to go somewhere. There were certain places he told him not to go. Um, but anyway, he goes to Philippi. Things that you've heard about Philippi are things that have maybe popular references for you. When he went to Philippi, first of all, they didn't have a synagogue. Most of the places that he went to did, and that was always his first stop. You know, first you go to the synagogue. Well, they didn't have one in Philippi. Um, but they did have a group of, of Jewish believers, and they met down by the river. And so he went down by the river. And, uh, and the leader of this little group, or at least one of the leaders, was this lady named Lydia. And he met Lydia there for the first time, and we know uh, she made this purple cloth. And she was actually a lady of means, uh, which was important because they kind of needed her help. Um, to get things up and running. So he met with them, talked to them a little bit, and then he and his group started to preach. The group was basically Paul and Silas, and he had Timothy and Luke along with him as well. And they started to preach. And the other story that you may remember from Philippi is about the girl who was the fortune teller, and she was, you know, demon-possessed, and she was able to tell fortunes, and uh, basically followed Paul around, and... Um, and basically got on his nerves enough that he said, demon, come out. And when he did, she lost her ability to tell fortunes. And the people who owned her at the time, she was a servant for these guys, and they were making money off of her, they got upset. They went and talked to the people in Philippi and said, hey, those guys just took away our moneymaker, uh, and they're saying bad things. Uh, you need to throw them in jail. And they did. And they threw them in jail. And I think Brandon actually preached on this in the spring when they were in jail was that famous scene, uh, Paul and Silas in the chains, and at midnight, after that, sorry, before they threw them in jail, they beat them with rods, right? So they beat them and threw them in jail. And in chains at midnight, after being beaten uh, in this new place that they didn't know anybody, under pretty bad circumstances, their response was to start singing. And so they were singing joyfully, okay? Uh, again, in this jail. Of course, earthquake, jailer uh, is ready to kill himself. They're like, no, no, buddy, we're still here. And that jailer gets converted, okay? He says, what do I need to be saved? And takes him to his house. He's saved and his whole family is saved. All right, all of that is to let you know that that, Lydia and the people that were converted and the jailer and his family were the beginning of the church at Philippi. They then grew, hopefully, uh, well, I'm sure they did, over time, and we don't know about that. We don't know exactly how that happened. We do know, or at least we believe, that when they left, Luke, they kind of left Luke along with them. So one of their groups stayed, stayed behind. And as they did that, over time, this church grew, okay? And so Paul is writing to this group, this church. is about 10 years after he first was there, and he's writing to this group, this small, relatively small church, uh, of Philippians. But here's the thing, and here's where we need to remember before I start hitting the, the word really hard. Paul was writing a letter to these people in this church that he helped to, to start, okay? This church plant, if you will. He was writing a letter to them. He did not know 
and didn't realize that he was writing a letter that was going to be part of the Bible. He didn't realize at that time that he was writing a letter that was going to be read 2,000 years later. 2,000, over 2,000, to you. He, didn't, he was writing a letter to these people and basically trying to give them encouragement, saying, hey, guys, uh, you make me joyful, although there's a little bit of, you know, there's a little bit of that you need to forgive one another stuff, so let's touch on that. But in general, you guys create joy in me, you church that I'm writing to. But we know that God knew when Paul was writing his letter that that wasn't just Paul writing a letter. That was God writing a letter. Paul didn't know it. Paul was writing a letter. Maybe he did. Maybe he felt inspired, but he couldn't have known how that letter was going to spread, and he couldn't have known that he would be writing to us 2,000 years later. But that's what the Bible is. This is the inspired, God-breathed, if you go to 2 Timothy, word of God, which basically means that God used Paul and everybody else who wrote this book to write what he wanted them to write. Okay, he inspired them. He filled them up and with his breath. And as those words were written, God knew when they were written 2,000 years ago that that was a letter to the Philippians, yes, but it was also a letter, get ready, to the Rutgers Villians. <laughs> you guys are the recipients of this letter that was written 2,000 years ago. God knew it. And here it comes. It's the letter to the Rutgers Villians. In other words, we're the Rutgersville Baptist Church. Okay, so for those of you that are like, well, I don't come from Rutgersville. Yeah, but right now, you're the church of Rutgersville Baptist Church, okay? And this letter is to you. So we need to pay attention, not just as something that, oh, gee, that was a letter. That was, yeah, that was interesting. Look what he said to those people. No, look what he said to you and me. Okay. All right. With all that said, let's actually jump in to the word. So please turn with me, if you haven't already, Philippians chapter 2. We'll start with verse 1. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if you have any... I'm sorry, I'm reading from the NIV, so yours might be a slightly different. But therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion... Let's stop for a minute. Uh, if you're reading from the New Living uh, from the NLT... They list all those things as questions. There, there are question marks behind each one of them. But basically, these are questions that should be rhetorical. Okay? Um, this is Paul saying these things, and basically the answer ought to be yes. Okay? Do you have these things? Yes. Yes, you do. Okay? And, excuse me, and it, as it happens, excuse me, all of them have to do with unity. Unity, if you look back at the, at the first line, unity comes from encouragement in Jesus. Unity comes from the comfort of God's love. Unity comes from the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Look at those first three things. Okay, Jesus, God's love, right? Uh, the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're keeping our focus. Uh, last time I used an acronym for joy, and I said, Jesus, others, yourself. Okay, we're still on the J. This is all the J. Okay, this is all Jesus-related stuff. Encouragement from Jesus, God's love, filling up fellowship of the Holy Spirit. All of those first, okay? And that's what he mentions here first. And then he says, also, this is the others part, okay? Unity comes from affection and compassion. Different words are used in different translations, but tenderness, I think. Uh, I think Bill mentioned mercies, right? Tender mercies. Um, but those words are the ones where you focus on the other person. Right? I'm going to show affection and compassion. That's what I'm going to do for someone else, right? especially if they are part of my family. Right? I'm going to make sure that I am showing those things. And to start with, I'm going to have the encouragement of Jesus. I'm going to have God's love, the comfort of God's love, and I'm going to have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That comes first, right? But then I'm going to show that affection and compassion uh, for others. All right, verse 2. 
Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Now, if you've ever been in a family or even a marriage, uh, you know that's a tough one. That's a little hard to always be like-minded, to always be thinking alike and thinking the same, right? Um, in a church with a whole lot more people than most families have, um, it's that much harder for all of us to be like-minded, for all of us to be of one mind, thinking one thing, right? Um, pretty tough. But if we can do that, if we can get to the point where we do think one thing, there could be lots of other things going on too, but the things that are important, if we focus on those one thing, those single-minded things, which in this case are just what I mentioned a moment ago, think about together those three things, encouragement in Jesus, comfort in God's love, fellowship in the Holy Spirit. Those should not be, Paul is saying here, Okay, that's a given, guys. Right? Yes. If you have these things, and you better, then unity should come along. Okay? So have those things, and the other is the tenderness and the compassion, the affection and compassion for one another. Have those. That's where we need to be like-minded. That's where we need to be of one mind. We all are going to encourage one another in Jesus. We all are going to have the comfort of, try to give each other the comfort of God's love, the fellowship of the Spirit, and again, affection and compassion for one another. Um, so one of the commentators, uh, you may or may not be familiar, A.T. Robertson, uh, been around a long time, uh, he said, he put it this way, this idea of uh, unity. He said, the church should be harmonious in soul. They should be souls that beat together in tune with Christ and with each other. I think he put that really well, uh, much better than I did. Um, so the idea here is basically we're on the same team. Yeah, we're a family, but we're on the same team. And I didn't get a chance to use my Vince Lombardi quotes last time. I had to go over them very quickly. So I got to squeeze one in here. By the way, Vince Lombardi, uh, people came up to me afterwards. Who's this Lombardi guy you're talking about? Uh, the younger generation. Well, anyway, Vince Lombardi in the 1960s uh, was probably the greatest football coach and may still be one of the greatest football coaches of all time and uh, led the Green Bay Packers to numerous wins, including the first two Super Bowls. And um, anyway, uh, he had lots of great things to say. Okay, And here's one of the things. Somebody asked him, he went and he did a lot of speaking engagements. And at one of his speaking engagements, uh, one of the reporters or people there said, what does it take to have a winning team. What do you need? And Lombardi said this. He said, there's a lot of coaches with good ball clubs who know the fundamentals and have plenty of discipline. He said, those are two of the main ingredients, but they still don't win the game. Then you come to the third ingredient. If you're going to play together as a team, you've got to care for one another. You've got to love each other. Each player has to be thinking about the next guy and saying to himself, if I don't block my man, then Paul is going to get his legs broken. I have to do my job well in order that he can do his. The difference between mediocrity and greatness is the feeling these guys have for each other. Um, I think that's amazing. And that's definitely the feeling we should have for one another. Okay? We're not a bunch of football players uh, wondering who to block, right? Uh, we're a church, and our goal, that one single-minded goal of having the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, serving God, and looking out for one another, that should be a no, should be a no-brainer for us. Okay? And we need to be thinking about it, not just in terms of, oh gosh, what do I need to do? But in terms of, oh gosh, what does this other person maybe need right now? How can I help them by what I'm doing? How can I look out for my other teammates right, uh, by the things that I do. In a healthy church, each Christian should learn to care for others. As we take seriously Jesus' command to love one another, I thought that was pretty awesome because uh, I had it in my notes. Brandon pulled out John 13 and, uh, and the commandment, right? Jesus' new commandment. 
as if they didn't have enough. You know, the disciples had to be sitting there thinking, really, really, do we need another commandment? Uh, and Jesus said, yeah, you do. And here it is, okay? The commandment is love one another, okay? Uh, as Brendan read. And if we do that, we will contribute to a winning team. Okay, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Go on to number four. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. This is pretty similar to what I just said. You're looking out for somebody else. Uh, the Greek words that they used in the original text here, one of them, and some of you may have this, I think the King James uses the word strife. And strife actually was only used prior to the New Testament writing uh, by Aristotle uh, when he was talking about electioneering. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad this election is over. Uh, I've been, oh my gosh, hearing it, seeing it, everything. I'm, I'm okay with the way it turned out too, but I'm mostly glad that it's over, right? So we maybe don't have to hear about all the you know, all the nasty campaign ads, all the ads about, oh, gosh, look how awful this person is. No, look how awful that person is. All of that nastiness uh, is, is what the ancient text were talking about when they mentioned strife, this selfish ambition that Paul is talking about here. Okay? Try not to have that in your church. Okay? Church is not for that. Leave that somewhere else. The vain conceit, of course, that's, that's all about building me up, right? I'm, look, how, look at me. I, give me some attention, please. You know, look how great I am. And these days, um, <laughs> it's hard not to see that, right? When you look out there, and uh, the kids that I taught in school, it had gotten to the point, and it didn't happen all of a sudden, but it seemed like it came pretty quickly. Um, they were all about what, no, nothing seemed real to them unless they could take a picture of it and post it somewhere. It's like it didn't happen. It was only important if they could post something somewhere online and say, hey, look at me, look, hey, look at me, give me some attention. They didn't say it that way, but that's kind of how they've grown up. And the people they cared about most were the people who were online who got a lot of attention. How many, and here's the term they use, followers do they have on social media, on Instagram and Twitter and all these other things? All these people, gosh, look how many followers they have. What can I do to get some followers? Wow, I posted this thing and guess how many people liked it and how many people wanted it? All of that stuff is about attention, trying to get more attention. Hey, me, 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 right? And here Paul is saying to us, Rutgersvillians, that's worthless. That's vain. You don't want that. Forget that. Okay? Looking for attention for me, uh, you know, nobody cares what you ate for dinner. Right? Stop taking pictures of it and showing us. Okay? Um, or they shouldn't care. Um, same thing, your family, right? Uh, okay, that's great. But in the old days, in my day, uh, we would go over to somebody's, if there was a dinner party, we'd, we'd go over to somebody's family dinner party, and the worst, the, the, when they'd pull out the, oh, oh no, uh, those, was when the family would say, let's show you pictures, photos from our recent vacation. And they'd pull out the projector, and they had a slideshow, and they would show you slides from their, and we're like, oh, okay, all right. Well, now it's the, you know, now you just post it on Facebook, and you say, hey, look, look at my family, look at what we did. Um, Okay, and cats, oh my gosh. If you have cats, oh boy. Um, okay, anyway, but all of this is about attention, right? Look at me, uh, see me, let me show you how great I am, and, uh, and look, let me, see, let me make sure, oh yeah, oh, oh, I got 25 likes on that one. Uh, that's how we value ourselves, or that's how some people seem to value themselves, okay? Um, worthless, vain. Um, interestingly, President Reagan had on his desk a sign, and the sign read, there's no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. Yeah. That's 
the idea that we should have. That's what we should be doing. Again, the second part of that verse, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others, right? We want something to happen, and we don't care who gets the credit, right? Forget the credit. Forget the attention. Forget the posting of whatever happened, right? And this is about humility, and humility is the key to unity. Humility, uh, another commentator said, humility leads to fellowship. Pride leads to division. Worthless attention leads to division. Because when you say, hey, me, 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 then the other person is not going to care about you, you, you. They're going to they're gonna see that as a competition. Well, let me see how many likes I can get. As opposed to looking out for each other. Thinking of others. All right. Um, as it happens, this past year, um, there were... We saw a lot of stuff on the news about this, but um, there were actually a lot of psychiatric issues, a lot of mental health issues. And um, I would argue, excuse me, and, and others have as well, that part of the problem, well, I mean, others have said so too, all this time that people were having to spend online led to many of those mental health issues. They talked about the isolation. They talked about uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the loneliness that the kids experienced and the adults as well. Um, but recently, they've also talked about Facebook and Instagram and those things that get posted and how especially girls, I think, had poor uh, self-images because they were seeing all this stuff online and they had to compare themselves all the time to these things, all this personal attention was leading to. And uh, years ago, they talked to uh, this famous psychiatrist. His name was Carl Menninger. And uh, he had created the Menninger Clinic, uh, which was a famous clinic and did lots of good work. But they asked him if someone felt like they were going to have a nervous breakdown or a, at that time, that's what they called it. These days, they would call it a, what, a psychiatric episode or a psychological, uh, some kind of problem. They said, what, what, do you, what do you suggest that they do? And this doctor, famous, I'm not sure about his, his faith. I don't know about that. But anyway, uh, he said, if you feel a nervous breakdown coming on, I would urge you to find somebody else with a problem, a serious problem, and get involved with that individual, helping him or her to solve their problem. In helping him or her to solve their problem, in reality, your own problem is going to disappear. You're no longer thinking internally. You're no longer letting things gnaw at your stomach. You're no longer getting disturbed about yourself because you're not thinking about yourself. You're thinking about others. I don't know what your objective in life might be, but there is something, there is something each one of us can do. Think about the other person and it will actually help you mentally and psychologically uh, as well as spiritually, right? Um, Okay, and yes, I'm about to wrap things up. Uh, the other part of this message, this, this verse 3 and 4, um, it's used a lot. Um, I've heard sermons about this um, in relation to, to marriages, in relation to spe specific family issues, and husbands and wives, right, and how they get along. And the idea is that in a healthy marriage, you have to think about the other person. The, the line, the first says, uh, make others, sorry, I left it, um, not looking at your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others, right, in humility. And in a marriage, you have to think about the interests of others. You have to think about the interests of your spouse, right? And sometimes that's hard for us to do. Uh, we have a tendency, especially in marriages, because we get so familiar, excuse me, and so relaxed that sometimes we forget to actually think about our spouse in that respect, you know? You need to be thinking about their needs and how you can help them with their needs. And most of us think along these lines, right? So I know Annie's needs are to make sure I have a nice dinner whenever I want it. And her needs are to make sure that I'm comfortable in my recliner and to be able to look longingly at me for hours while I watch football. 
<laughs> all things that she needs, and I'm prepared to provide those for her anytime she wants them. Okay, those might be my needs, right? Um, they're not her needs. And even though those things might have happened, and they might happen on a regular basis, they're not necessarily happening because I'm fulfilling her needs. They're happening because of habits, and they're happening because of, you know, me wanting my needs fulfilled. Um, in a church, we need to do the same kinds of things. We need to think about what are the needs of the other people around me, and how can I fulfill them? And it's important here, just like I did, not to impose or pretend your needs are the same as someone else's, right? Um, I can pretend that Annie needs to sit there and look at me longingly for hours. Uh, she doesn't really need that. That's, that's wishful thinking on my part, okay? Likewise, in the church, it's important for us to look around, try and identify what other people's needs might be at the moment. And you know, the thing is, we're doing a pretty good job of it. A lot of us are doing some pretty awesome things. Um, all the Samaritan's Purse stuff, my goodness, you know, uh, Judy, Barbara, Maxine, all the stuff that you guys did, along with all the other folks who came and helped uh, pack these things. Um, there are people around here working behind the scenes who do so much for the church with no expectation of credit. Nobody's looking to get, uh, please, hey, I'm going to go out here as Kathy works outside on the plants and things and keeping things pretty. She's, she doesn't want anybody to come take her picture and post it. Please, uh, post my picture fixing these flowers. The ladies that are working down in the kitchen to prepare this meal for us today, um, working with Teresa and her crew, um, doing a fantastic job down there. Um, they're, they're not looking for anybody to take their picture and post it on Hey, hey, look, look at what I'm doing. Look at how, hey, give me a little credit here. That's not happening, okay? They're doing that out of a servant's heart. This past week, uh, we had a dinner at uh, the Lafayette was uh, announced and uh, uh, basically happened because Dawn made it happen. And uh, Dawn works there part-time. And, um, and she arranged with uh, the owner of the Lafayette for us to have this cause night. And some of you showed up, and that was really nice uh, that you had uh, dinner with us there. And basically, we received 20% um, of the overall uh, meal cost, and then we received all of the gratuities. We had volunteers from All Blessings Flow who served as the waitresses and, uh, and staff that night, or at least most of the staff. Um, we ended up raising right at $1,600. It was amazing. It was awesome. And... Uh, it was a lot of work involved, but the people that were working to, to make that happen and the people that came and showed up, yeah, they enjoyed a nice dinner, but, but they were there mainly because they wanted to help us. They wanted to help all blessings flow. Uh, they wanted uh, to, to promote this, as we, and I'm not going to get into that too much, but all blessings flow is a service organization. We're serving others, and, um, and we do that uh, because hopefully we're serving God in the process. And, um, and anyway, those people that were, were doing those things and acting like servants to help us um, was an excellent example of this. One more little example, and a very brief one. And I'll close. Last week, I'm coming down the stairs. Uh, I was up in the booth. I'd done all the stuff up there and had closed things out. And uh, I'm one of the last people leaving just happened to be that day and I come down the stairs and I'm in a hurry and Annie's somewhere and I don't know where she is I'm trying to find her and as I'm coming down the stairs and I'm walking through here I've got my uh my bible in hand and I've got my coffee cup my mug that I carry with me and that particular day I hadn't finished most of it and had about a third of the cup still there and sure enough as I'm coming around the corner fumbling boom there goes my coffee cup bang hits the floor coffee everywhere. I'm like, oh, really? That guy, Adrian, sorry for putting you on the spot, happened to be standing nearby. And without hesitation, he said, don't worry, Mr. Doug, I got it. And here's, I mean, this was coffee and it was all over the floor. And so we went and we pulled some paper towels down, you know, out of the bathroom. And, uh, you know, I was coming. He's like, no, 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 man, I got it. I got it. And he took the paper towels and, and he started out with his foot and it wasn't working well. And he got down on his hands and knees and wiped up 
this and didn't think a thing about it. He's very surprised and probably embarrassed that I'm mentioning it now. But that is an ex excellent example of what a servant's heart is all about. Amen. Right? There I was, and I had a need. I had a need in that moment, and again, without hesitation, he just said, eh, helping you out. And here's this kid, you know, on his knees, hands and knees, cleaning up my mess, right? And, and then, you know, got that taken care of, and I, you know, I, I, was, I was cool. I was like, oh, let me help. No, no, I got it. I'm like, are you sure? No, I got it. And uh, I basically was off the hook. Well, that's what Jesus did for us. Jesus stepped in to this mess that we made of our lives, and he let us off the hook. He jumped in and said, I got this. This isn't a mess that you have to clean up with some paper towels. This is the mess that you can only clean up with your life. You owe me. There is a debt that I owe, and the debt is your life because you have not lived it properly. You are supposed to die. It's that kind of mess because of something you did. But I'm going to step in and I'm going to take it for you. That's okay, Doug. I got it. And Jesus came in and he cleaned up my mess. Amen. And he took care of the problem that was there that I caused. Okay? That sinner's heart that is still in me. Okay? Uh, but I've accepted him into my heart now. And so the mess that we all have in all our lives, all of your lives are messes, and I'm sorry, all of you are sinners, just like me. And we all need somebody to come along and say, eh, got this. And in fact, he's already done it. It's already there. All you have to do is say, wow, thank you. I accept that. I accept what you did for me. And I love you for it. And I'm going to follow you. And I'm going to follow you in Rutgersville Baptist Church. That's not that important, actually, though. It's important for us as a church. Where you follow him isn't as important as that you follow him. But if you follow him at Rutgersville Baptist Church, you Rutgersvillians, if you do that, you need to not only follow him and do those three things, right? Think about the encouragement in Jesus. Think about the comfort of God's love. Think about the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Not only have those things, right, but have those things for, oh, sorry, for one another, right? Have those things for others and include in those that number four point, which was compassion and affection for others, okay? Care for them, love them, the people that are here. Okay. Um, we're going to have our hymn of invitation here in just a second, but I should say uh, right now that if you have not done that. If you have not asked Jesus into your heart and asked him to come in and clean up your mess, uh, this is an opportunity to do so. While we sing this hymn of invitation, if you feel so led and this is something that you want to happen for you, come on down here. Brandon or I or somebody will talk to you and, uh, and help make that happen for you and you will join this fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Because, sorry, if you haven't done that, you can't join. If you haven't asked Jesus into your heart, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You can't fellowship with the Holy Spirit if you don't have him. And the Holy Spirit is there when you say, Jesus, come into my heart. Now's an opportunity to do that. For those of us who have, those of us that are believers, and we know Jesus is in our heart, uh, as members of this place and members of one another, uh, now's the opportunity for you guys to feel joyful and to realize that this unity that we already have, all we need to do is keep it going. We just need to keep looking out for one another and trying to help one another and making sure that we maintain that focus on Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, Wilbur, come lead us in a, in a, in a hymn.
for our benediction. Please bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you for being in this place today. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that has filled this place and filled these people. Uh, thank you so much, Lord, uh, for Rutgersville Baptist Church. And most of all, thank you for Jesus, Lord, uh, and for his sacrifice for our sake. We thank you so much for the love that you show us each and every day, for the blessings that you bestow upon us in so many different ways, Lord. Uh, we ask you, please, to help us take this joy that we feel and take these blessings that we have uh, inside us and share them as we leave this place today. Right now, Lord, we ask you to bless this food uh, that we are about to partake and bless all those hands that prepared it, Lord. Thank you for all the servants in this place. And please continue, Lord, to guide us and direct us and lead us in the service, the ways of service that you would have us to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.